So I got into drumming when I was 19 after I moved out of my parents' house. Obviously, uh, they didn't want me to have a drum set. I had a guitar. Um, I had some friends that played guitar that were way better than me. Uh, one played bass. No drummers. So I decided in my, um, you know, um, one night that I was just going to go buy a drum set. And I was going to be the drummer for this group of people just playing music. You know, so um, we had this drum store called uh, Dunham's House of Music, which is no longer around here. I saw the cheapest drum set I could find. It was like 500 bucks. I think it was a CB 700, super cheap, bottom, bottom of the line uh, drum set. They got a 22-inch bass drum, 22 by 18 bass drum, um, 12, 13-inch toms, and a 16-inch four tom, and two cheap cymbal stands, and a cheap hi-hat stand with some really cheap cymbals that came with it. So it took me about three weeks to buy it, to get it off lay away. Got it home, set it up, had no clue what I was doing. So I went back out the next day, bought a book, How to Play Drums, Level 1. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Music Matters in that podcast. I'm your host, Brian. And joining me today, Jason Gartner. How you doing, brother? I'm good, man. Thanks for having me on. No worries. And a special shout out to Dave Kaminsky because uh, I saw you were on his channel. You actually did a drum cover and I guess uh, the band was called Temptations Wings. Yeah, it's my band. Is it? Yeah. I do have to seriously ask because uh, I'm a big fan of the music or the band Down. Is that where the... Yes. Is that where it came from? So when I joined, the name was already established, and I didn't feel like it was my place to um, recommend anything to do with the band. So after a while, when we got merch and stuff printed off and CDs, it was kind of like too late, almost in a way, to worry about changing it. So the name just stuck. <laughs> That's pretty cool. I guess the song you covered, was that your favorite song you guys made? Um, It was the easiest one to do the least amount of takes. Because I know he was kind of like, yeah, we got like four to six hours. I was like, well, some of them are a little faster. I don't, if it's going to be to a click, I want to make sure that it's one I can you know, be pretty comfortable with. So I think it was uh, six takes, but only five full playthroughs because the, one of the intros I botched right off the get-go, so that didn't really count. But <laughs> so yeah, it was like I think it was like the fifth one is the one we kept. Uh, I see. Yeah, I know that feeling too. Whenever I help on a drum set, I, there's like some days where I'm able to like get it in like one take, especially today because I was actually doing one of my Silverstein covers. And I, yeah, I was, I was thinking to myself, this song was actually pretty tricky too because of how much it moves between the set between hi hats and ride cymbal. So I think like yeah. I think at some point I'm going to screw up, but we'll just let's we'll just see what happens and hope for the best. And I was all the end product. They like that's damn good, man. I'm I'm going to take it so. But there's other times. Yeah, where well, it's like, if it, it wasn't for, if it wasn't for the times. video, I probably would have had. I probably could have done like two takes, but the video had to match up, and to keep from like having to edit and like do a bunch of like tricks with editing and stuff, he just wanted me to just nail it all the way through. So that's what we did. So I see. And I guess how did you and Dave meet? So actually, he moved down here. I'm in the Asheville NC area, which is in the mountains. Um, he moved down here and opened a studio up. Actually, funny enough, like five minutes away from me. Um, so he was looking for, um, like people to do drum play through videos for free. So obviously I was like, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. So I hit him up and then the, uh, the night before I was supposed to go over there, he was like, let me send me you my address. And he sent it. And I was like, there's no way this address is, is correct. So I sent him, I was like, are you uh, over like in the Jupiter area? And he's like, yeah, I was like, dude, I'm five minutes away from you. I'm practically your neighbor. Um, so, uh, yeah, so it was, like, even better. I didn't have to drive far. I didn't have to back up my drums or nothing. I just put them in the back of my Tahoe and, and took them over there. So the setup and uh, dismantling was cut in half because I didn't have to, like, back, it, back everything up and, you know, all that good stuff. So, so was, yeah, it worked out pretty well. I was only trying to remember that one commercial where, like, they packed up getting ready for, like, a camping trip. All he just did was just back up and then back up to the pretty much, like, store and it was just open area. He's like, we're here. It was, like, that sort of thing. Yeah, I so. think I remember that vaguely, yeah. I it wasn't what, quite that easy, but um, it was it was easy enough. I would say I forget what brand it was, or at least what the commercial was about. But that's kind of what it reminded me of too. But right, yeah, I actually did interview Dave not too long ago, and I released his episodes. I I don't know. Did you have a chance to see it? 
Um, I watched part of the first one. I fell asleep, not because it was boring. It's because I laid down and I hit the perfect spot on the pillow, and that was pretty much it for me. So, uh, so yeah, I, uh, I'll probably finish it up tonight now that I'm back home. That's good to hear. And uh, I guess, are you doing okay? How's the family doing? Oh, everyone's good. It was my wife's uh, uncle, so we had to go down there. Um, it was um, it was like a sudden thing, but the funeral home was booked, so the yesterday was the earliest i could get in so we had the we left like late friday night after you know um kids got done with what they were doing and you know stuff like that and we got up saturday morning went to the funeral hung out saturday and got up this morning headed back so mm. here i am i see and i'm sorry for your loss i i know it was more your wife's more from your wife's side of the family too so i just wanted to yeah i mean luckily he was pretty he was up there in age so it wasn't like too shocking but it was still pretty sudden, so yeah. you never really know, man. You just uh, you just wake up one day and that might be it. I mean, it's really hard to say, any, you know. Yeah, absolutely too. But the good news is we get to at least share the story here, so people get to know you a little bit more. That's pretty much what the podcast here is all about, really. So okay. just kind of reiterate, it's pretty much just to get to be, know people more, both as a musician and as the person too. So I already sent you the questions, so hopefully you had some time to review. I guess I you're did. ready. Yeah, let's go. All right, let's start with the first one. Tell us a little bit about yourself. How did you get into drumming? So I got into drumming when I was 19 after I moved out of my parents' house. Obviously, uh, they didn't want me to have a drum set. I had a guitar. Um, I had some friends that played guitar that were way better than me. Uh, one played bass. No drummers. So I decided in my, um, you know, um, one night that I was just going to go buy a drum set. And I was going to be the drummer for this group of people just playing music you know so um we had this drum store called uh, dunham's house of music which is no longer around here i saw the cheapest drum set i could find it was like 500 bucks i think it was a cb 700 super cheap bottom bottom of the line uh drum set they got a 22 inch bass drum 22 by 18 bass drum um 12 13 inch toms and uh 16 inch four tom and two cheap cymbal stands and a cheap hi-hat stand with some really cheap cymbals that came with it so it took me about three weeks to buy it to get it off way away got it home set it up had no clue what i was doing so i went back out the next day bought a book how to play drums level one i still had that book actually i had a cd with it so every example in there had uh the cd would play the example so I just learned. I just started like page one, and I would just change pages as I kind of got the hang of what they were doing. So the goal was to have like three or four drum beats that I could change in between to feel like a really good drummer. <laughs> After like you know a few weeks, I sucked. I was the worst. But um, I did pick up enough to like keep in time with those guys who were like way more advanced than I was. I mean, they were playing like originals and like you know ACDC covers. Stuff like that. So the ACDC stuff to me by ear sounded like I I could do that. It sounded like very entry level, even though it's anything but the Phil Rudd stuff is super hard. But to like the untrained ear, I mean, it's just basically like one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, or one and two and three and four. So I figured like I can count the four over and over. I should be able to get this. So I just kept at it until finally one day. Um, someone broke out uh, Detroit Rock City, and I pretty much played through the uh, all the way to the uh, bridge, you know, no problem. So I was like, after that, I was kind of like, I might have this um, if I just keep with it. So that was all single pedal stuff too. Um, and then over the years, you know, um, that project disbanded. Um, we found someone else to play guitar. Me and the bass player did, and it was a little more aggressive music, and that's why I got my double bass pedal and was trying to incorporate that. And at first, it was like. I was just kind of like triplets, you know, I could do triplets. I couldn't really sustain anything. And I, I would try and try, I would go home and play. And, you know, I didn't want to go too late because I had people around me that I could probably hear it. Cause you know, sound travels at night, pretty far, vast. So, um, yeah. And then one day there was a song that this guy, um, brought, it's called hellbender. I remember it pretty, pretty, pretty vividly. And I just, uh, started playing to it and the double bass just kind of flowed out of me. And uh, I was like, that, I remember that moment pretty, uh, it was a pretty special moment in my drum playing. Cause like I tried for like, it seems like months and months to like learn how to sustain double bass. 
And then after that, all, and then after that, it's just like the riff brought the double bass out of me. So, I, I, I don't remember what that song sounds like anymore. We never recorded it, which is unfortunate. But um, but yeah, that was the song that like just let me know that I might be I might be kind of decent at this after all. So, <laughs> oh man, that's an extensive story too. And uh, I got to start with Detroit Rock City because that's actually yes. one of my dad's favorite songs. So mm-hmm. whenever it's on Ozzy's Boneyard, we're always cranking that thing up during the beginning there. And then we just tone it down afterwards. But it's always yeah, the beginning. That should be- on Ozzy's Boneyard, it's on every day, I'm pretty sure. Probably a few times a day. <laughs> it's something like that because it really does not branch out and like play like any of their lesser known songs. It's like anyone that's like been like their big hits. And it's like the same with pretty yeah. much every band, really. So, yeah. It's kind of unfortunate, too. Uh, did you say anybody in your family was also big into instruments and also big into music, too? Like vocals so or So, my, um, my dad's, or my dad's brother, my uncle on my dad's side was a pretty accomplished uh, classical music. Uh, guitar classical guitar um player um but as far as like drumming uh, no nobody was a drummer or anything uh, my mom has a brother that's really good on guitar also i got um uh, my mom's other brother is uh plays a uh, hammond organ um stuff like that but as far as like drums i didn't have anybody to lean on i mean i, I didn't have anybody, anybody really give me a lesson on gu- guitar either it was basically the same thing. Like I bought a, a cheap acoustic guitar and I bought some like, guitar world magazines and figured out how to read tab. And then, you know, just kind of like went from there. But, but the drums was better because I'm not good with the small surface areas. My hands are kind of small for like some of the note for some of the chords. So I was like drums, like, well, I could take, you know, big stick, go boom on these like big pads. So that's probably the instrument for me. So I just stuck with it and, you know, Obviously, looking back, I wish I was better at guitar so I could be playing guitar and not have to pack up so much crap when I go play shows or record because I'm always, you know, first one in, definitely the last one out, packing up. Um, but it just is what it is. But not, I don't regret it. I mean, I, I enjoy playing drums, especially when, you know, you're complimented. Like, that was some really good set or that was tight or, you know, stuff like that. It makes it worth it. I would say we get to beat things legally, as we could probably say. So, <laughs> yeah, that's my favorite saying: "Big stick go boom." You know, like well, that's, a, that's me. <laughs> was it the UFO that made that song? A long stick go boom. Afterwards, uh, it could have been, or it might be Crocus. I think it was Crocus. Sorry, I think. I think yeah, I think Crocus is more like it than UFO. Did you, you say right, UFO? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, originally I thought it was UFO, but I think I was getting it mixed up. With another song too, but I think it was Crocus who had made that song too, and I always laugh whenever I hear it these days. Since <laughs> you know what yeah. they're referring to, yeah. so all right. So I guess uh, talk about your drum sets. Uh, has this been the same one you've been rolling with, or is this something you got somewhere down the line? So, like I said, my first one was a CB seven hundred. I don't have, I have it still, but it's in like it's just like stacked up, collecting dust and whatever. So what I have now is a Pro Export, uh, like a tobacco sunburst finish. Um, it's a 22 by 20. It's a little bit deeper than my other one. Um, I have a 10, 12, 13, and 16 toms. Uh, 10, 12, 13 mounted, 16 floor. I use a 15 inch. Uh, I use all Sabian symbols. Uh, 15 inch AA symbols. Uh, 16 crash, 18 crash, uh, 15 crash. Call like a V crash, which like it was like it was an AA, but it's like some weird series. It's like more like an accent. And then I use a, um, I think a 12 inch like splash China. I think it's 12 inch. And then my snare is a 14 by five by five. Yeah, I use all um, use all Remo heads, uh, pinstripe on the top, just plain Remos on the bottom. I never change the bottom heads, so they're they're brand new still. And then uh, I use a uh, Vic Firth uh, seven seven AN drumsticks because i hit so hard that if i have the big clubs i would probably bust more cymbals than i do so um also i think the nylon tips uh keep the finish on the cymbals a lot longer than the uh, wood tips so that's why i use the nylons plus i like the way they bounce off the cymbal a little bit better they got a little more bounce to them makes it a little easier for me when i'm playing like intricate like uh patterns with my right hand stuff like that so and then an iron cobra double bass pedal <clears throat> that i've had for like forever I think it's still just smooth as silk as the day I bought it. That's pretty sweet. Yeah, just a little bit WD-40 once a year is about all I do to it, and then it it holds up. So 
Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. How did you get into like the metal music and that sort of genres? So that's pretty much what the guys that I uh, were playing that when I forgot my drum set was like metal and hard rock and stuff. But even in high school, I always was like drawn to it because it wasn't really about like an image or like, oh, this is evil or my parents say I shouldn't listen to this or whatever. It was just like I like the way it sounds like it's it, like it's pleasing to the ear for me. Like it doesn't matter what kind of metal it is. It could be it could be like death metal. It could be classic metal, uh, trad metal, you know, whatever. It all sounds good to me because it's just the way the guitars sound, the drum sound, the production is, the subject matter, even the singing. You know, like I just think, like in all honesty, that metal musicians are like pound for pound the best group of musicians alive because there's so much to do with music theory in it. You know, it's it's crazy when you. When you when you strip it all back and study it, like you like there's scales, you know that there's plenty of scale runs that are solos. There's uh, phrasing, there's melody, there's harmony, you know. There's um, multi-track guitars, like um, the bass is you know always pretty high up in the mix and stuff. And not to say that it's not like that for other um, genres too, but it's just more. I think it's just more meaningful in metal because it's like it comes more from a place of like passion and hobby than it is like i'm gonna get in this genre because like everyone like a lot of people in this genre like make it big really quick like country or pop it's like you don't really need to be talented in those genres per se not to say that there's not really talented people in those genres but it just seems like if you buy the right song from a guy who knows a guy you can be famous like overnight whereas like when i'm rocking metal it's like a journey like you start at the bottom and you like work your way up to like from like metal Monday to like opening for like a decent regional band on a Friday. And then after that, you like get invited out of town to like a festival with like two regional bands or like a national band. And then you just like, kind of like you just kind of build up, you know? So it's like when you, some, when a lot of these bands get to the top, it's like a real like thing of like, um, to celebrate because you know that these guys were probably in your position at one time or another playing for one dude at Metal Monday in a basement of some crappy bar. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so it's just fun. It's like the camaraderie. Like, you know, you kind of know where all these bands came from. Like, even Metallica or, like, any of those bands, like, they started at the bottom at one time. Like, they weren't playing stadiums in 83. They were, like, playing, you know, Metal Monday's in California somewhere and stuff like that. So, I did ask, do you guys do Metal Mondays? Is that where the term comes from? <laughs> well, um, there used to be a Metal Monday around here, but it is a term that's pretty common with uh, a lot of bigger cities um, <clears throat> because, you know, obviously Metal and Monday start with M. So someone got the big idea. It's like, oh, hey, these two go really good together, even though it like, kind of sucks because like, it's like it's Monday. Unless it's like a, a big band coming through, like nobody really wants to play on Monday. But sometimes, when you're cutting your teeth and these like in, in the scenes that you're in, like Metal Monday is really you know your best bet to, if nothing else, practice live um, in front of strangers in a different place and hope for the best. Like you never you never know who's going to be at any of these shows, but you kind of know in the back of your mind that it's probably just going to be a waste of time uh, in the long run. Maybe maybe a couple drink tickets, you know, or maybe like fifty bucks or something. But yeah, it's like trying to escape the metal Monday. Um, it's like trying to get over the metal Monday rung of the ladder is what what it's all about <laughs> when you first when you're first starting out. I was AF M and M too, so I figure like it's a nice little nice little blender too. Well, there's no did... there's no metal Mondays in Asheville anymore. There was a venue that did it, but they they closed down for the pandemic. Uh, I see. So as far as I know, there's no like true metal Monday showcases here in town anymore. But um, there is one in Louisville, Kentucky. I've heard that's really good. Like it's pretty uh, pretty popular. So um, you know, to each its own. But um, but yeah, Monday we we've done the Mondays before. It it, it sucks. <laughs> uh, I see. I was gonna say they went back to doing the underground sort of scene in Asheville. Uh, Back when it's like need exclusive doors right here and then it's like people just open the doors and like it's an underground sort of stage or something like that too so as you well, said going back underground yeah there used to be a pretty cool speakeasy that would have metal on like uh fridays and saturdays um it was kind of like that like 
you'd be walking by and not even suspect anything was going on. And you would like open a door and there'd be this like blast of sound coming out. And you know, either people were like, Oh, this sounds cool. Or they would just like cover their ears and run, you know, that, that kind of, uh, that kind of thing. So, uh, RIP Fred speakeasy, by the way, cool place, but it's, uh, it's no longer around. Uh, I see. I guess another victim of the pandemic. No, it shut down way before the pandemic. Uh, hmm. The guy just moved to Florida and just sold it, and some um, somebody bought it and did something totally different with it. Uh, I see. All right. Uh, we'll get to the pandemic in a little bit, but I did remember what hmm. I wanted to ask earlier because I was in Asheville a couple years back, and uh, yeah. one of the things I noticed was a bunch of musicians, each like one was playing drum sets, others were maybe doing guitars and stuff like that. Uh, when people, whether they come down, move down to Nashville, or whether they've been there their whole life, do they normally start off playing on the streets, trying to at least get their name out there or trying something to at least get their name out there. So did you say Nashville or Asheville? You know, it's a little bit, I did accidentally mix it up at times, but I didn't, I didn't mean to say Asheville. Okay. I was just wondering, cause I was like, I can't really speak for Nashville, <laughs> but yeah. So, um, Nashville, yeah, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of bars that do like, um, singer songwriter stuff. Yeah. I know people, people are pretty active in that circuit. Like as far as like coming from all over the place, um, a lot of, there's a lot of people who will just set up on the street and busk. There's actually a guy who plays a whole drum set who busks that. Like every time I see him, I throw him 10 bucks because I know how much work he put into hauling all that stuff from his practice space to set up on the street and then go park his car and then walk back and stuff like that. So, um, it's a pretty, it's a pretty vibrant music scene. It's just like metal is not, I don't really think metal is considered music as far as like um, the big um, like promoters in town go. Cause there's a lot of like street festivals and stuff. Like they have a thing called like downtown after five and it's always like three or four bands, but it, they're never rock or metal. It's always like, it's always like a tribute band or like Americana or like some kind of like under like alt country or something like that. Um, there's some pretty good bands that have made it from here. Um, there's a band called Basque that's pretty popular. They're from here. Um, there's also uh, Warren Haynes from uh, Government Mule is a uh, native to the area, although he doesn't really play here much. Um, about once a year, maybe twice if you're lucky. Um, there was a couple pretty big metal bands that made it. One was called Inte- uh, not Intefid. Um, their name is eluding me right now. Um, but there was a band signed to um, Roadrunner Records uh, back in the early 2000s. That was pretty big. They've tour- they have toured with some pretty big metal bands. But as far as like just bands like household names, there's not really that many that come from here. But a lot come come here to play. Um, but in, with, in a lighter, lighter variety of music, like uh, Jason Isbell in the 400 unit, I think he's here like twice a year. Um, a lot of, uh, a lot of, a lot of bands play like the orange peel, which is like a 1200 capacity venue, um, that people probably are really passionate about, but I have no idea who they are. <laughs> a lot of them. Cause I really, I really don't pay attention to many bands outside metal unless it's just like someone I know, or it's just like really cool, like kind of like country underground country stuff, which I can, I can get down with. It's just not my preferred, um, my preferred thing. Uh, I see. Sorry if I accidentally mixed the two of them, but I would say I was in Nashville not too long ago. It was actually last yeah. year or two, so it's actually pretty killer music scene too. Even bar hopping on Broadway whenever you go there too. Yeah, we we uh we played there like uh, probably like nine years ago, I think, um like right around the corner from Broadway, and uh, yeah, it was a pretty wild place. I never went back. Um, my wife said I can't play there unless we go there on vacation first. And uh, so maybe one of these days I'll vacation there and then get to go back and play. But uh, yeah, it was it was fun that one show we did. It was it was pretty awesome. I remember they paid me with a check, which I thought was bizarre. And then I lost the check, so we never really got paid for that. Oh god, <laughs> we didn't no. get paid for that show. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think that's why she doesn't want you going back. She doesn't think you'll be responsible handling the money or that sort of thing. No, it wasn't that. It no, was no, just okay. like okay. yeah, it wasn't that. I mean, it was only like it was only like a hundred dollars. I mean, it wasn't like anything to cry about, but still would have helped for gas. But um, yeah. But at least yeah. immediate necessities. We'll just say that. Yeah, but so. I, I, never, I never been paid with a check before. I always thought that, I, I remember that being pretty bizarre. Even like nine years ago, it's like it was all cash at the door. What is this check? You know. So. 
I think I think it's starting to come around these days. I think it's I want to say if it's more like part time sort of jobs where you're just there as you were like just one night too. I think that's how they do it instead of just like paying in cash because I imagine that's kind of a little bit of a hassle too. So I just thought maybe it was easier, probably easier to pay. So probably, but it was like one of those computer printed checks. It wasn't even like filled out. Like it was, uh, it was like they they printed it out for their computer. You know, so all right, fair enough. But I guess uh, you did talk about some of your bands right now in the beginning when we were talking about like who you were in general. I guess uh, yeah. Uh, talk about the current band you've been a part of. So I've been in Temptations Wings since 2007. It's the only band I'm in, the only band I want to be in. Um, I've had offers to play with other bands, like either permanent or just like fill in, and I just I just don't because I I just don't have enough time to dedicate to my family and my band one band so. I'm a one band kind of guy. I know a lot of people play in multiple, but I just do one. But um, yeah, we've released um, f- four full length albums. Uh, two of them are out of print and probably never be heard by anybody else because <laughs> they're pretty bad. Um, and then we've recorded like three, two EPs and a live album. So yeah, about 20, almost 20. Let's see. 2007, 2017 would be 10 plus 6. Yeah, almost 20 years, and we've we've had a decent amount, you know, of uh, output. And we've done some really, really good shows. But uh, overall, it's just me and Micah are the, are the nucleus. He's the uh, guitar player. Uh, funny story, the band I was in before was going to play a show with his band, uh, or with uh, Temptations Wings in a different version. And that was going to be their first show ever. And they and one of them like the guys like left like pretty soon before the show. So I always remember myself saying like if this band ever bust up, I'm gonna hit I'm gonna hit this guy up because his riffs are like really what I'm looking for. And sure enough, um, the guitar player and me just kind of like didn't really see eye to eye on some stuff. So when the when we disbanded, um, I hit up uh, Mike on MySpace if you remember that platform. And uh, we've been going at we've been at it ever since like pretty much inseparable like we never we never really had an argument about anything like music wise or anything wise like if we just kind of both know like if a riff doesn't work or just not really what we need we just kind of move on or we just like record it and put it in like in a bank of riffs we have and um and we just write till we're both pretty satisfied uh that's the way it used to be until we became a three uh our current lineup our current lineup is a lot more um, democratic. Uh, so we have Chad Barnwell and Ryan Fox, who are from the band uh, Through the Fallen, who are from Asheville, more of like a thrash um, style band. So we've kind of took like the, the Stoner Doom and like the thrash and kind of like just mashed it together now. So it's kind of like a pretty cool hybrid of like slow and fast, you know, like down tuned and like speed, um, stuff like that. And then we just write about like, you know, we don't really write about like life experiences. It's just kind of like, Hey, this is a pretty cool subject matter. Like in the fantasy realm, let's just like write a song about this or do a concept album about this. Or, you know, uh, I heard this like phrase. That's a cool song title. Let's just, let's write a song with this song title in mind. Um, stuff like that. So we're not really like serious about like any kind of image. We just like playing and we just let, let our like influences like bleed out of the music. Um, and that's more of like me and Chad because we're both big eighties metal fans. So like, I'll hear something and we can just like be like, dude, that was like the riff from like still the night. It's like, you should do like, you should like imitate like one of the guitar solos in this part just for like a nod. And we just like kind of get a kick out of like, just like having fun with our music. Was that boy? I love still the night from white snake. I think that was definitely one of my favorites from them too. I know. That was one of the ones yeah, they tend song. to play a lot. It's a great song, man. I mean, like, a lot of people are like, ah, 80s metal. But I'm like, dude, a lot of that stuff is pretty damn technically superior to a lot of stuff you hear nowadays. So you shouldn't knock it just because it came from 1980 or through 1989. But a lot of this, but at the same time, a lot of the stuff is goofy as shit. I'll, I'm not going <laughs> to. So. Yeah. I would say your band kind of reminded me of Sword in a way, kind of the way the music Yeah, that's another was. big one. Yep. Yeah, we're actually in the same tuning. I call it the Doom tuning. It's a C standard. So that's what we're in. Because mm. that's pretty much where Micah's vocals kind of lay um, in that 
not tuning anyway. But yeah, the sword's a big one. Um, we're actually covering Freya for a uh, upcoming release one of these days. We're doing like a covers album with like B sides. So like we'll release like a cover in a in a in an original song together, um, and then release an album of it. But Freya is one of the songs on there. But that song is really that band is really really talented because until you like start trying to replicate everything they do, you don't really know what they're doing until like you can't do it the first time. Like I've been struggling I've been struggling covering the drums on Freya for like a year now. Like I I work at it like a couple times a week on my electric kit here in my room here. And, um, man, I just don't feel like I'm just anywhere up to par on the song for myself. Chad comes in, listens to it once and, and play the whole thing can play the whole thing. Yeah. No problem. But me, I'm just like, man, we, maybe we should record this one last to give myself enough time to, to do it. So also I'm not really trained by anybody. So like my style is kind of like what fits me more than like trying to replicate somebody else. Like I can never replicate note for note, uh, the song Freya. It's impossible for me to do it. Cause like some of the stuff, my body just doesn't, my body just doesn't play that way. You know, we're like, um, the drummer for the sword on the first three albums, his name was Trivet Wingo. That dude's like all over the place. Like he does some crazy shit. And actually the, um, the re-release of God of the earth. Have you, have you heard that? I think I have. I yeah, think- so they re- they remixed it and remastered it. And man, the drums on that are so clear that there's stuff that he played that I had no idea he even played on because like in the in the original mix, it was like kind of muddy. And I just assumed it was like bass. But in this new mix, it's like all drums. And he's like even more talented after listening to that than I thought originally. I was like, "Whoa, man, this dude was like this guy was like on another level." I mean, it was nothing flashy or amazing. It was just like solid and really added to the song, which I don't think my drum playing is really like adding to a song more than like supporting a song really is my style. But, um, but yeah, there's a lot of drummers, man, that I'm just like, if I could just like have like a little bit of that talent, I think I could do so much better, um, for my band, but nobody ever says anything to me. So maybe I do a good job. I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you know, it, it, it's good and it's also bad at the same time when people don't give you that sort of criticism because, one, you get that mindset thinking like, oh, my drum is doing good. Everybody, no one's really saying anything. So exactly. it's like, I'm doing something right. Yeah, like every once in a while, like, one of the, like Chad will just like try to like tell me how to like what he's thinking in his head. And it sounds like the dumbest thing I've ever heard. I'm just like, dude, what, what, are, you trying to, what are you trying to tell me? Yeah, he's like, but uh, I'll, I'll attend it. And there's been some stuff that I've kind of like tried uh, the way he sounded it out, and like he was like, "Yeah, that's it. That's exactly what I was thinking." So you know, I, I guess I serve a purpose, you know, to the uh, to the guitar players in the band. <clears throat> oh, you did mention about electric drum set. Uh, what brand is it? Um, I just got a cheap Alesis. It's like the bottom of, bottom of the line uh, Alesis. Um, I actually have it set up exactly like my drum set up in my uh, practice space, minus a couple cymbals because I ran out of inputs. But yeah, I just um, it's an Alesis, and I just uh, have like a I uh, I modded um, a custom setting and just tuned all my drums into pretty close sounding to my drum set as I can get. I mean, it still sounds fake, but um, the good thing about it is though you can send like a MIDI file to like like when, like when we're going back and forth like riffs and stuff. If I get sent a riff, I can play to that riff and send a MIDI file back. And then he could just like put in like Superior Drummer or whatever programming he has, and then he can just change that MIDI file into like some really good sounding drums, you know, and just kind of like have a like a foundation for a song that doesn't sound like too like artificial or or electronic. I think that's where the music seems to be going these days, especially now with how technology has advanced so far. Yeah, and uh, I would say that's pretty much what I've been using. I've been rolling with Roland for a good while, and I'm thinking of upgrade my kid at some point i'm looking like one of those hybrid sets but uh i use the superior drummer and that's sometimes what i use with my drum covers and i have to say it does a nice job i mean i feel like it really covers it up i guess if you really put your ear to it maybe you can maybe point out thinking like that's a little artificial in a way but it's like yeah but it works so i mean 
Yeah, there's some really good um, YouTube videos of people who do drum covers, and man, this, and their stuff sounds good. And a lot of them are with the Elisa's kit that I have. I mean, it looks like a toy. Like, it's just like, it's all black. You can adjust the heads a little bit for, like, more of, like, bounce and stuff like that. But your cymbals all kind of sound the same. You know, <clears throat> I have a, I actually cheated and have a double bass pedal. Um, I bought another Elisa's kick pad and put a splitter in between them. So, like, it actually works as double bass, which helps for like you know just uh exercises and stuff like that for for me um and like i said i can record it right here and just send it to whoever and they can mess around with it or whatever so yeah, it works out good oh, i see and uh i was gonna say do you you do use that in your recordings and then i guess uh is it just mainly for like rough drafts like hey this is the idea we have before we head yes to the studio? yes yes i would i would never record my electric kit for a final product <laughs> um no matter what like i have i will go to a studio and record my acoustic my pearl drums um because like i you know over the last few years we've recorded i've come i've been kind of picking up some stuff and what you can you can you can pretty much send all your drums as a file um and then you can put it in any kind of doll and then you can just kind of like you can just kind of mix them um, with guitars as you as you need. So like recording from now on, it'll probably just be me going to record drums either at Dave's or some other studio, uh, just getting the files uh, as they're recorded, and then uh, Chad can uh, put it put those files in his DAW, and then you know he can mix them as he needs to in the song when we start tracking the rest of the stuff ourselves, which that's what we're kind of working towards. But unfortunately, we don't have anywhere really good to record drums that sounds good. Like we play in a barn, and it's a bit a uh, bit boomy in there. Um, so yeah, probably just recording in a professional studio for drums at least will be the way we go. And then after that, we can do the guitars and stuff at home. Yeah, because we're because he they have all like uh, modeling amps now anyway. Um, so it's really not it's really not that big of a deal to record a modeling amp with a you know, a room, uh, like a cabinet um, imitator run through, and, you know, you can have any kind of sound you want, really. It's pretty amazing. Yeah, that's the beauty of the home studios that recently came about the last decade, when you think about it, too. It was actually more especially true, I guess, now because of the pandemic and everything. And I guess, speaking of which, uh, how bad did the pandemic impact you and your family and everyone in your community? You know, except for not practicing a lot, it really didn't devastate me a month that much i mean we we played like a couple shows during the pandemic there was a couple venues were like hey you know if you just like play it safe why don't you come down and play you know so we we still were kind of active we would just like wear masks and stuff when we're in the same room or three of us would obviously mike couldn't because he's a singer so uh we we were still pretty safe and stuff but we we just wrote a lot of riffs you know um i discovered a lot of music I, uh, I started a podcast to keep money coming in for the band, you know, um, which is now part of a group called the Flame Keeper Network that me and another guy have done since. Uh, stuff like that. So, yeah, I mean, I did what everybody else did. Just, uh, you know, <clears throat> kind of believe the hype, kind of doubt the hype at the same time. Just do what you thought was best for you and your family and, you know, play it safe around others, you know. Okay, so did you have any brushes with COVID, or were you pretty okay for the last three years? No, I'm, I've, I don't think I ever caught COVID. I don't think anybody in my family did either. Uh, Micah did, Chad did. I don't think Ryan did. Um, so yeah, it was just kind of more of like an inconvenience for me. I mean, you know, we did what we all had to do, and whether or not it was worth it at the end, I guess we'll never really know. But. Um, Cause like the, I, I'm, I, I don't think the book is closed on the effects of what everyone did during COVID. Like, you know, 50 years from now, you know, the vaccine could be a time bomb and everyone just start dropping dead. I mean, who knows? You know, nobody really knows. That's it's the scary part of like, like I heard this one guy, like not, I'm not getting political or anything. This, this phrase just like was like the truest thing I ever heard. Like raging this machine, you know, the track was fuck you won't do what you tell me in 2021 it's like fuck you you better do what they tell you you know it's like damn but like, everyone is just like pro-government now it's like what is this like why is everyone pro-government like government sucks it sucked then it sucks now it sucked forever 
why is everyone putting blind faith in this institution that nobody likes? Still know. the greatest nation was, on earth. It was just weird to me. I don't know why. I don't know why everyone was like pro government for a while. You know, it was, it was bizarre, to say the least. Yeah, I I didn't really get it either. In fact, I'll tell you on the plus side, I was able to work from home during that time, so that was at yeah. Least- well, I, I actually got laid off and started a, a business of my own, just doing like um like handyman work, like hanging TVs shelving um putting you know pictures on the wall building building furniture etc 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 and um when i got laid off i just started doing like gig apps like i would just go and someone would be like i'll just sit in my living room while you're in my bedroom putting my dresser together or whatever and, and then there was like no no uh con- money uh traded back and forth so it was pretty much like i wear a mask when i went into their house so i got to the bedroom put the furniture together put the mask back on get my tools up Go out of their house, check in on the gig on the on the app, get paid next day, just to get out of the house. I feel like I was doing something, and then um, after about a month, I was like working like fifty hours a week off of like repeat business and neighbors, and I never went back to my job. I just told the guy I'm gonna stick with this because I'm making way more money and I can get up at like ten o'clock if I want to, and nobody nobody can get mad. Like nobody relies on me to pick them up because they got. DUI and I have to be there, you know, 45 minutes early to get to work at eight o'clock, which is taking time out of my day, stuff like that. So that, the opportunity actually got COVID like really, really actually was a benefit for me in that regard. Cause like I, I am like totally free of any, um, work that is dictated by somebody else. Like I just like bid on jobs or people call me to do stuff, menial tasks, whatever. And I go do them, and I go home. It could be 2 o'clock, it could be 4 o'clock. It could be 11 to 1, and I'm done for the day. It's just, it's just nice. Like, the freedom is awesome. So, really, I mean, looking back, COVID was kind of a blessing for, for my household, at least, you know. Yeah, I remember always, in some of my interviews, and I've always kind of asked that as a separate question, but I've always brought up, like, was there any sort of blessing in disguise that COVID had done? And it's good to yeah, see that like, you found a, that out. Geez, a lot of people are still, like, just, like, terrified of it like you'll see them wear a mask in their car by themselves like dude you can take it off in your car it's okay you know you just like want to tell them it's like dude take a breath you know it's fine now because whatever's going to happen is going to happen and everyone's everyone's just in it now you know so yeah and let's just hope we're starting to get a new page or Turn the page to a new chapter, as we'd say, as we try to move on from COVID, too. So Yeah, I'm afraid it got so politicized, though, but it's, it's always going to be an issue with, like, politics. Like, every four years, it's going to be, like, you know, this these people are going to do this to you. You better vote for me. I'll do this for you, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's all, it's all BS. It's always BS, you know? Yeah, let's just hope. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Let's let's be hopeful yeah. here, people. Let's just be hopeful. It's like to me, it's like if you're putting this much effort into like just like trying to get votes for something that really isn't that big a deal anymore. Imagine what kind of imagine what you could do if you could like get like the drinking water in like Flint, Michigan, like drinkable again. Like do something like help mankind instead of just like hindering mankind. You know. That's what I would say. Government sucks, but you need it. It does. That's what it I really think. does. They don't do anything meaningful. Like the only thing they ever agree on is like give themselves a, t- a pay raise or like another holiday for themselves or military you know? defense. Like other than that, there's like nothing going on, you know? So <laughs> it's like, I don't know. I don't know what my tax dollars go to. You don't do anything for anybody. I would say maybe a certain degree military defense, but we leave that up to them to decide. So yeah, I don't know. That's why I don't like the politics too stressful. To be honest. Yeah. So. I mean, it really is like, dude, I, I unregistered to vote. Like, I was so sick of getting calls and mail that I unregistered in my county. I was like, I'm done. You know, they're like, what? Are you moving? I was like, no, I'm not moving anywhere. I'm just I'm just sick of it. So they, they unregistered me. I, I don't get anything anymore. I'm like, cool. This is awesome. Still got to hear about in the news. Still got to see the commercials on football from, like, three different states. But, yeah, other than that, I'm good. Yeah, I'm All done right. with politics. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. All right. That's well, good to see you, mate, through COVID. And it's good to have you around here, mate. And uh, I guess let's see. Uh, what do you love most about drumming? Well, it's definitely not setting up and, and loading up after before and after shows. I can tell you that. Um, yeah, that's the lowest on the lower, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, so. it sucks, man. yeah, it's so uh, it's so much work. But I will say, like real quick, um, the best drumming warm up for me for live shows is setting up my drums and playing immediately after. 
because I am so limber from like kneeling and twisting and moving my arms and all that stuff that is really the way I prefer to play is just set up play and then break down because I'm just like it's I, it's the best I'll, it's the loosest I feel all night. Um, I've played shows where I've set up my drums and waited like three or four hours and it was like it was a disaster. Like I was I've been drinking because I was bored and I got cold and I didn't I didn't warm up right or whatever and so so yeah um, setting up and then playing is definitely my uh, my preferred way to go. But as far as like the drums, like as far as like getting the aggression and stuff out of the day, man, it's really just like driving the song to me. Like it can be as fast or slow as I want, and nobody can say anything. It's like if the crowd's really into it, speed it up a little bit. Nobody's really gonna be mad, um, you know. Uh, if the crowd just kind of sucks, you know, it's not really into it, and then you you know you can try some some new things, see if something works, something sticks, something doesn't. So really, it's like just being like the driving force behind the song and uh, being, um, I don't know, man. Like sometimes it's like, sometimes it's also like being on like a high wire. Like if you mess up, like drop a stick or something like that, people people know it right away. Whereas like if you hit like a wrong guitar note or chord or something, you can just like, like bend it until like it fits in the song or something. It's not that big a deal. So yeah, I guess it's like really like the uh, the high wire uh, act. Also, is like if, if you fall off this high wire, everyone's gonna know it. You know, you you messed up. So it's kind of like the um, I don't know, like the I guess it's like being on your toes at all times. You know, kind of thing is a little a little bit exciting. Yeah. You know?